I've known Brother Harbit since the days years ago in Austin, and have thought very highly of him. But I wanted Brother Dub McClish, who's been very close friends with Brother Harbit, to introduce him, and so I've asked him to do that, Brother Dub. Well, I've known Don since Noah got off the ark, almost. <coughs> I don't know if you know it or not, but there are some preachers who are older than I am, <coughs> and it's my privilege to introduce one of those this morning. <laughs> uh, I can't say that about too many, by the way. Don and I do go back a number of years, uh, and I've appreciated him through all the years that I've known him. He has uh, done local work at various times through the years. But uh, the last several years, he has uh, had a real job, <coughs> supported himself while he preached in uh, various places. He's been in the monument business in Denison, Texas for a number of years. I've lost count of the number of preaching trips he's taken to Ghana over the years, but it's been quite a number of them. And. Uh, I'm sure that many of you are aware that he has uh, written much good material. The latest thing that he's written, and it's just almost, the ink is hardly dry on this book, is a commentary on the book of Revelation. And there's some on the table back there in the back room. Visions of two Jerusalems. And as you see, it's not an extensive work, but I'm really looking forward to uh, reading it. Don has proved himself a good thinker, a good writer, and a faithful soldier of the cross. He's had a lot of struggles the past 12 months, a little over 12 months, 15 or 18 months. He lost his uh, first wife, Faye, who many of us knew, love companion of many decades just about a year ago. And he had some serious illnesses uh, at the same time, had a ruptured appendix while his wife was <laughs> in critical condition in the hospital. And uh, so this knocked him down physically as well as uh, otherwise. But he's recovering well, and we're thankful for that. And he has met a lovely lady, uh, Jewel, who is here with us today. And she's sporting a uh, ring on uh, one of her fingers that uh, Don said uh, he got in a Cracker Jack box and just thought he'd <laughs> give it to somebody. <laughs> <laughs> but we're in for a treat as uh, Don reviews one of uh, F. Lagarde Smith's books, uh, The Cultural Church. Don, come and preach to us. Thank you, Brethren Brown and McClish. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this week. I'm grateful to the elders for allowing me to be here and for the fact that you kept me on your prayer list along with my wife before her passing several months ago, and uh, we appreciate being associated with good brethren. I think all of us can give our thanks to the women for the good food they provided we need to keep those good sisters in mind and all who have helped with that. My assignment for today is to review a book entitled The Cultural Church. I bought this book about 12 years ago on the recommendation of a brother in the Lord and I read it I appreciated a whole lot of things that were in the book. Then came the opportunity to review it for this lectureship. And I didn't remember very much that had been said, but I did have it marked up pretty well. I contacted the preacher who recommended it to me and said, what do you remember about the book? 
He said, I don't remember, but it, there must be something wrong with it. <laughs> and I felt perhaps the same way. I want you to know that I'm not responsible for anything else Lagarde Smith wrote since the writing of this book. I found this book to be a fairly good book on hermeneutics. And my presentation today will not be highly critical all the way through. There are some things we're going to deal with, but I want to observe some of the good things that are here, and they will be helpful to us in the struggles that we're facing. It was about 35 years ago, as I recall, when so many of the thinking got out and thinkings got out into the brotherhood about uh, the new hermeneutics. I read a lot of those things that came out of Pepperdine and Abilene, and many of them referred to one particular man who happened to be a Bible chair director in Grayson County where I live. And I got some of the material that he had, and I noticed that he was so influential that with some of those brethren that they would often, often quote what he had to say as if he were the final authority in these matters. He wasn't, and we all knew that he wasn't. Anyhow, I read the book, The Cultural Church, again, and want to call attention to some things that Brother Smith has to say. He divides the book into three major parts. Part one deals with the efforts of some to call for a new system of hermeneutics. Part two deals with the irrational efforts and the consequences of these hermeneutics if they were accepted. And part three seems to be an effort on the part of Brother Smith to reword our present system of hermeneutics so as to create a better understanding on the part of everyone. I want to begin with a quote from Brother Smith on pages 14 and 15. The first premise of this book is that the church is at great risk of becoming a cultural church. By that, I mean a church succumbing to a culture which is, in the last two deca decades, has radically changed the way it sees the world, and even in a secular mindset that has little regard for the authority of God's revelation. The second premise of the book is that recent calls for a new hermeneutic may reflect the cultural influence more than any of us are prepared to admit. End of quote. He goes on to say, we need to point out that by culture, we're not talking about physical conditions. And as we think about this, we know that culture does change through the years from one country to another, from one decade to another. But the kind of vehicles that we drive are the kind of tractors that we use, the way we plow our ground. Those things are not the kind of cultural things that we're concerned about. We're talking about those moral and spiritual issues that are debated and minds are changed because the secular and the religious world is so influenced by these sinful practices such as same-sex marriage, abortion, living together without license, the use of alcohol and various types of drugs, a number of moral and religious spiritual issues. And those are the things that seem to be influencing us and as we move along, we are always prone not to be as critical as we once were, and thus the climate has changed. And with the idea that whatever is right with you is right with God. Whatever pleases you pleases God. And we want to be politically correct. We don't want to be disagreeable in any sense of the word. Therefore, it calls for some way to reach a different conclusion that we've reached before, and that's what we're talking about in this idea of the cultural church. Now, we should not follow a multitude of people to do evil. Moses gave that instruction to the people, and the Apostle Paul said, be not conformed to this world, and whatever may be legal is not necessarily right in the sight of God. Brother Smith went on to explain that hermeneutics simply means the method by which we understand the original intent of Scripture and how we decided such methods. He is careful to define the old hermeneutics as command, example, and necessary inference. Now, many of us would differ 
with the use of that word inference because implication seems to fit the picture better. That comes from the writer or the teacher, while inference is something we draw from what has been implied. But nevertheless, he uses that term as we will some see in some of these quotations. Now, Smith warned against a common enemy that threatens to consume us all, and that what we're seeing now is going to seem like child's play compared to what we will soon be hearing from today's youth. And you may have read some things from other books that Brother Smith wrote after he wrote this one that seem to indicate a different change in philosophy. But like I say, I'm not responsible for those things, but this may be some of the things that were involved in his thinking. He went on to say this, as part of the most conservative stream within the church, the non-cooperation or anti-institutional congregations, as they were variously known, I had always resented the label legalist. If it was law I was following, nevertheless, it was God's law. All I could see in those whom we called liberals was a kind of soppy, all is love, lip service to scripture. With the liberals, it was the spirit that counted, not doctrine. For my money, spirit was just a smoke screen for doing whatever you wanted to do, regardless of what scripture might have to say. For many liberals, hermeneutics is just one more thing to be free of in their pursuit of spirit-filled living. Spirit-filled living. Right here, we might point out that Brother Smith admits that he came out of the anti-cooperation, anti-orphan home movement. And at this point in his book, he seemed to be fairly well grounded in the subject of hermeneutics. And in view of some of the material later presented by him, we are reminded of the old pendulum on the clock as it swings from one view to another. Smith goes on to say, we shall see that the fundamental basis for our hermeneutic is found in the New Testament itself, being the very approach used by the apostles and Jesus himself in interpreting Old Testament scriptures. If it is ours, not ours alone, end of quote. He points out that we are to respect the word of God that led godly men in search of a method by which to understand God's revelation. And he pointed out that our hermeneutic is different in that it, is, it commits us to the authoritative leading of the scripture and not a substitute for the scripture. He states that our hermeneutic has a nickname called pattern, which is really the pattern of sound teaching, and that patterns do matter because they are God's patterns. He re referred to the fact that the era of the independent Christian church is to refer to God's patterns as models which would put a less restrict approach that may have resulted in the increased role of women in their congregations and also the use of instrumental music and in worship. Now, the end, near the end of chapter three, he makes a statement that is well worth quoting in full. Have we ever stopped to consider why God caused holy men of old to record not just the life of Christ, but also the work and worship of the first generation of Christians? If the ultimate aim of apostolic instruction regarding the work and worship of the church is to bring us back to God, as more and more are urging, then it becomes all the more important that we follow the apostles' authoritative lead in that specific area of Christian practice. Proper church organization and function does not in itself get us right with God, but improper church organization and function, whether because of sterile tradition or unbiblical innovation may indeed get us wrong with God, end of quote. He points out that the application of command, example, and implication is not an addition to the Bible and that it points the way away from human formulation to get us back to how we ought to live and to worship. In this section, Brother Smith begins with a chapter on book, chapter, and verse. He does attempt to suggest that our critics may be right in saying we give too much attention to specifics. Here's what he said along that line. I believe that we have tended to elevate the church of Christ over the Christ of the church. 
looking back on the way we often packaged our presentation of the gospel. It was almost as if, despite what was said at the moment of immersion, we were baptized into the church instead of being baptized into Christ. End of quote. I believe that Brother Smith speaks for himself in this instance. It is true that we are baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27. It's also true that we're baptized into the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 12.13. The body of Christ is the church, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. So aren't we saying the same thing along that line? Maybe one reason we say what has been said here or what he suggests is that the reason we may talk more about the church sometimes, realizing that it is the body of Christ, it is Christ's body, is because the issue is not so much the person of Christ with the denominational world, but it's the church. So this is where we seem to zero in in our presentation along the line. In this part of the book, Brother Smith states that we are a clearly biblical designation, Church of Christ, and we sometimes talk about it that way, but end up that many capitalize the word church, uppercase C, and this seems to make us a denomination in his view. Now this may come out of habit. It's not proper to not capitalize the word church sometimes, especially on stationery or at the heading on an envelope. But I do not believe that just because we use the uppercase C that we automatically become a denomination. Now it's true that it is just as scriptural to refer to the church as the church of the Lord or the church of God as it is the church of Christ. When Paul wrote in Romans 16, 16, he said, all the churches of Christ salute you. This does seem to indicate that that was perhaps a more general term to designate the people of God in the first century. Now, Brother Smith says, suppose Paul had said, as he well could have, all the churches of God send greetings. With our signs and ads in the yellow pages, now read, Church of God. And my answer would be no, Brother Smith. We would not be doing so, for to follow your logic, we still couldn't capitalize the word church because that would make it a denomination. And you're not going to put church in the yellow pages without a capital C, unless you have another type of word in front of it. But perhaps the reason why churches today use the term Church of Christ is because one major denomination uses the term Church of God, and when that term is pronounced, we usually recognize which one it is. And in order not to be a part of that group, we use the term that no one else wants to use, the Church of Christ. The world seems to be antagonistic toward that very term. In the first century, when there were no denominations to compete with the Lord's Church, it was then relatively easy and unobjectionable to use any of these terms without fault. On pages 55 through 58, Brother Smith has a good dissertation on the advantages and disadvantages of documenting our messages with a particular verse and giving the exact location. Now in the first century, they weren't able to do that because they weren't numbered in that period of time. But we must not forget the context. And that's what he emphasizes, the fact that we ought not to forget the context. Well, I do not believe that we should. We ought to always remember the context in any given situation. Smith does point out the value of one verse in context is that of Galatians 3.28, which some of our critics have taken out of context to attempt to change women's role in the church. He says, as any objective reading will indicate, God's or Paul's letters to the Galatians is all about our vertical relationship with God, not our horizontal relationships with each other. In Christ, says Paul, all racial, social, and gender barriers fall with regard to salvation, page 57. Now, in every generation, there are new issues and new problems that create 
new problems for the church. Many of these problems disguise themselves under different names, but basically they are the same old issues we've always faced. Now perhaps LSD and marijuana were not well known by word a hundred years ago, but the principle of drunkenness and intoxication is still taught in the Bible and we can always fall back on these principles. So these new issues need to be put into force, dealt with based upon the old principles without claiming to come up with a new approach to find a way to justify some of these things. Smith says this, yet we must not give up on our hermeneutic simply because it may be suited to answering some questions better than others. Would we throw away a hammer simply because we've discovered there are some screws needing attention rather than nails? Of course not. When there are nails to be driven in, we still need a hammer. Likewise, whenever we look to the work and worship of the church, we must have some way of determining from the scripture how God wants us to proceed. Then he closes chapter 5 in part 1 with some good comments. There is no issue in any age about which God has remained silent. Somewhere in the scripture, look for it, God has spoken. And the chances are good that his words come to us in the form of some command, some example, or perhaps some inference, which we can draw from more direct biblical instruction, even if it sometimes is found in such unlikely places as the many regulations regarding church organization and function. This is the most radical question. Are we willing to trust that somewhere down the dusty road of the first century Judea, God has led us in paths of right living, even for a global community heading into the 21st century, end of quote. That completes part one of his book. Part two, in this section, he deals with some of the excuses offered by some who contend that we need a new method of interpreting scripture, as well as pointing out the consequences of leaving the old hermeneutic of command, example, and impl implication behind. In our time, most everything has to be politically correct. We're not to offend anybody or even hint that truth is only in one body of scripture and in nothing else. We want to be tolerant of everyone's views without disagreeing with them and then not leading them to the truth of God or even letting them know that we have an insight to God's will that they may not have because they haven't read the scripture. It is truly difficult to be tolerant to any and all forms of error. We're supposed to be tolerant to those who may disagree with us, but when they disagree, they become politically intolerant of us as we espouse a different view. It's sort of like not being so unkind as to even say, Jesus built one church, and then the individual with whom we may be discussing these things believes he did build one church, but they're in it, and we're not. So they become very intolerant of us. Then there is a discussion of a utilitarian hermeneutic or attempting to develop a new hermeneutic simply because after applying the old, we still have problems because the old simply doesn't work and whatever works is right. Now this suggests that each individual should have his own private means of applying scripture for whatever works for you is right. Now, Brother Smith deals with that. He gives two examples of what is not working. First, the introduction of instrumental music in worship because how are we going to keep our young people if we don't liven up our worship? And it's not a matter of whether the use of the instrument is right or wrong, but what we need to do to keep our young people going and keep them interested in the work of the Lord. And we ask why is this generation of young people so different than previous generations. In past generations, very few saw the need to liven up the worship to keep the young people. They were simply taught what's right and what's wrong. And together, we followed the scripture. Along this line, there are some that want to change the kind of songs that we use in worship, and even to abandon some of the old songs that we've used for so long. Many of those old songs were new to us at one point in our lives as we were young, and they're just as new to young people today. 
if we let them be. However, many say the young people are tired of the old songs, so they want to borrow some of the hip-hop songs of the Pentecostals, as well as trying to bring in the instrument with them. Now we wonder why some of the older Christians are not really the ones who are tired of the old songs. Maybe we've been here so long we're tired of singing some old songs. But nevertheless, it may be that the older ones are the ones who are wanting to make the changes along this line and using the young folks as an excuse. Are we failing to instruct our children anymore as to what God wants? Is it because of our lack of knowledge that may be destroying us? The second example that Brother Smith gives is to deal with that of giving women a greater role in the church. Or if we don't, we're going to start losing them because the younger generation of women want to get involved like they could if they belong to one of the many denominations of the land. But there's another thing that needs to be considered. Older folks need to be considered as well. You might lose some of the old folks if you change the church very much, so let's think about them for a change. More important by far, Brother Smith says, is the real reason by why a utilitarian hermeneutic is misguided. It simply doesn't stop to ask what God thinks about whatever question is of concern. If there is anything of which we can be certain from a careful study of the Bible, it is that God does not operate on the basis of majority rule or power politics, end of quote. We need to remember what God has to say, that his ways are not man's ways, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. And regarding the new hermeneutic, Smith says this, the women's issue is a perfect catalyst because it combines utilitarian practicality, current notions of political correctness, and an obvious case of, for tolerance, all in one neat package. He recognizes that, and I think we do today as well. He points out that there are seven basic reasons for male leadership in the church. Number one, because of creation. God made man first. Man was to become the husband, father, and family leader, as every successful unit must have leadership, and God assigns that to the male rather than letting each family decide for itself. Number two, God chose circumcision as a symbol of the covenant which was for males and not females. Number three, the priesthood for the people of Israel. God chose men to function in that way. Number four, the selection of the apostles as men shows God's choice. Number five, the record of specific teaching by the apostles of submission on the part of women to the men in leading and teaching in the church. And number six, because of the angels, 1 Corinthians 1 or 11 and verse 10, whatever that may mean. And seventh, because of the fall of the human race. It was in the creation that woman was deceived, or from the creation, and God holds man accountable for the continuation of his work on the earth. Smith examines the argument of slavery, tries to parallel that with male domination, din, uh, domination in the church, all right, he, he doesn't try to make the comparison, but some do, and he looks at that. And he points out that uh, some are saying that God wanted both to fade away into oblivion. But he, Smith points out that slavery was not commanded as an institution, while male leadership was. And examining these seven points listed by Smith, he states, in order to avoid hearing the message, we're going to have to shoot the messenger. And the messenger, in this case, is the old hermeneutic. If possible, of course, make it sound spiritual, perhaps a hermeneutic of the cross. Dress it up in culturally acceptable terms like justice, equality, and be sure to throw in a generous helping of biblical love. End of quote. He says, if we can't trust Paul on the role of men and women in the church, how can we trust him on baptism and the Lord's Supper? Thus, it is shown that the new hermeneutic is really no hermeneutic at all, for it promises liberty and brings us into bondage. In chapter 7, on rationalizing the irrational, Smith points out the inconsistency of those who attempt to rationalize themselves into irrationality. He deals with those who argue 
that the cross might be the basis for a new hermeneutic. He then shows how this would not work for such things as justice, baptism, truth, and love are connected to the cross. So when Paul said he would know nothing among the Corinthians, but Jesus and him crucified really includes everything related to the gospel and not just love. He said it is time for honest reflection in the call for a new hermeneutic. Are we to sincerely seek a better way to understand the unfathomable mystery of our salvation? Or are we simply being caught up in a postmodern generation that is intentionally and unashamedly losing its mind? End of quote. In chapter 8, he deals with looking at others to see ourselves. And he points out that various other religious bodies in the, in the world today are having some of the same issues that we've been having in the church. How to interpret the scripture in light of culture so as to continue on and to grow. He said, leave scripture behind in one area and you left it behind in all areas. So it is inconsistent to try to modify the scripture to justify homosexuality or women's leadership role in the church. In this chapter, he deals with the pitfalls of the pluralistic hermeneutic, which demands that there should be the belief that it should be universal acceptance of all thoughts, beliefs, and actions. Pluralism not only demands that we be gender blind and color blind, but also morally blind. He points out that pluralism is more concerned about pleasing most of the people most of the time with no regard for what we need to do to please God. He says, the more turmoil I see in the religious world beyond the borders of our own fellowship, the more I believe in both pattern hermeneutics and pattern theology. As a pattern hermeneutic, command, example, and necessary inference is by no means a perfect way of understanding the Bible but it embodies the right idea. It is confessional and submissive. It honors God's leading, and it fully respects the pattern theology in which Christ becomes the standard by which all things are to be judged. End of quote. He comments later as to what he meant by the new hermeneutic, or the old hermeneutic being, not being a perfect way of understanding the Bible. Because, he said, there are some areas where it just is not easy to apply and we realize that it, this is the case oftentimes. In chapter nine, Smith looks at the folly of those who are in using inductive reasoning to attempt to prove that inductive reasoning is fallacious. He says, the irony is that the scholars themselves or inductive reasoning, use inductive reasoning in reaching their more learned conclusions about the historic, historical and literary roots of scripture. In fact, it is also inductive reasoning that leads so many today to reach the conclusion that the old hermeneutic has outlived its usefulness. Instance after instance of scriptural abuse is cited, is cited in support of the death sentence for command example and necessary inference, and that is inductive reasoning, end of quote. We bring our review of chapter nine to an end by noting two short quotations. For those in the cultural church who clamor for a new hermeneutic in order to get around the plain meaning of scripture, the enlightenment's move away from the authority of scripture made it the new hermeneutic movement of the day. A new hermeneutic means nothing more than elevating culture, man, over doctrine, God. Page 126. Come now to part three of the book. Chapters 11 and 12 make up this section in which Smith proposes a new formula for understanding old, the old hermeneutic. He says that we might do well to consider purpose, principle, and precedent, probably capitalizing on three words here for memory's sake, using the three Ps. He, he adds, hopefully, the advantages of modifying the old hermeneutic will become obvious as we progress but the intent remains the same, to get back to the Bible, to speak where the Bible speaks and to be silent where the Bible is silent, to be people of the book, and more importantly, people of the God of the book, end of quote. He points out that too often we look to examples 
that may have incidental act action involved never intended to be a part of God's pattern, and we realize this to be the case. He says, whereas command, example, and necessary inference relate most directly to what the scripture means for us today, purpose tells us more about what the scripture meant in, to its original recipients. He also observes that not all biblical commands have the same significance to us now as they did when first given. For example, the holy kiss illustrates this, but he says behind that there's the principle of a good relationship in the body, a body of Christ. Another example is that of the veil in 1 Corinthians 11. And the principle here is that of women being under the headship of men, though it may be shown in various ways. And custom then was a proper use of the veil. He said the veil is being commanded only because its removal violates the principle of male and spiritual leadership. <coughs> End of quote. Smith then moves on from purpose to precedent and points out that the word precedent was used a lot by the restorers of generations past. And he looks at the case of the disciples at Troas meeting on the first day of the week, combined with other passages like 1 Corinthians 16, shows that their example set a precedent. However, there were many lights where they were assembled together and the service lasted till midnight and we know that, that that's not a precedent that is required of us today. They are but incidentals and have no spiritual significance. Smith points out that there are three ways of approaching an example to determine if it has any authority today. First, if there is an independent spiritual law or rule elsewhere that may show the basis for what is exemplified. And second, if there is an indication of an example leaving or having universal application. And third, if the examples represent stability of teaching over time, showing that such was expected of them. Now regarding inferences, he said, we live by inferences. As a matter of fact, without inferences, the Bible itself has no meaning to us at all. Consider for a moment that not one command in the Bible is aimed directly at any of us. No command or example has our name specifically written on it. Nevertheless, we rightly infer that what God directed others to do is equally our duty unless the sense of the context indicates otherwise. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, he said, you teach them to observe what I commanded you, as if to say this is to go on until the end of the world. Then we remember 2 Timothy 2 and verse 2, where Paul charged Timothy to teach others to do what he, Timothy, had learned from Paul. And this was to be handed down to each generation. Now regarding principles, he says, what principles do that rules cannot do is to bridge centuries of cultural change and always be applicable to the church in any culture. Not that culture determines the principle, but that principle answers the continued need of culture as it evolves. As culture changes, there is a temptation to alter external forms of worship so as to be more culturally relevant. In order to alter the outer forms, it often becomes necessary to minimize the impact of the scriptures which initially established those forms. That, of course, is a nice way of saying that at least in some instances, we must overrule scripture in order to achieve the intended result, end of quote. Now, he's not saying that we need to overrule scripture, but at least he does want to deal with that as a possibility that some would advocate. Brother Smith chides those who claim a working of the Holy Spirit in their lives as an excuse for doing what the Bible plainly forbids. He states, we must acknowledge that the Holy Spirit tells us nothing more than that which is written. And he's correct in that. Then Brother Smith appears to go against this principle by saying, we have come to accept the providential working of the Holy Spirit in our lives as a result of the gift of the Spirit, as per Acts 2 and verse 38. Well, how can we accept such, I ask? Has the Spirit told us that is the case? Joseph attributed providence to God 
And Paul, when he alluded to providence in one of his epistles, said perhaps neither were very dogmatic as to say this is the work of an angel. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. They did not conclude that. So I ask this morning, why bother to speculate as to which member of the Godhead is doing certain things for which we have no proof? If many times we hear something said, we know something takes place, we always want to say, that's the Holy Spirit doing that. And that's something that should not be done. Leave all of these things to God as far as his working is concerned. Then Brother Smith goes on to say that the Spirit enables him, the guard Smith, to open his mind to receive the truth and helps him in the discernment of truth already revealed and strengthens him to apply in his life what the Spirit has written. I think this is a dangerous statement. I know he says to me, but to say something like that is to suggest that it is also the case and could be and should be the case for you. This kind of information, of course, is suspect. Now, there are two major views as to how the Spirit dwells in Christians today in the first place. Whether it be the representative view, the Spirit represented by the Word, or the literal view, or the Spirit dwelling actually in a Christian, either of those views does not leave room for the kind of views being taught by some who claim they're strength, strengthened by the word, or they're enabled by the word, or by the spirit, rather strengthened by the spirit directly, or enabled by the spirit's presence to understand his word better. Now the older I get, the less I think I know sometimes. Not because I forget, but because I realize maybe some of the views I've had in the past were not exactly biblical, I know I've held both views regarding the indwelling of the Spirit. And as I ponder this matter, I find that the term indwelling of the Spirit or the indwelling of anything or anyone is something that is difficult to grasp in the Scripture. Let me show you what I mean. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 24, John said, He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him and he in him. In other words, we're talking about God's commandments. If we keep his commandments, he dwells in us, and we dwell in him at the same time. Then in uh, verse 12 of 1 John 4, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. And so if we have love, God dwells in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. Then verse 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believe the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Now I believe that we can see here that there is some difficulty in trying to explain how God dwells in Christ, and Christ dwells in God at the same time or that God dwells in us and we dwell in God. Could be that these are simply figurative terms to understand a relationship that we have in fellowship with the Spirit. We know that we are baptized into Christ. We're not literally in Christ. We're not representatively in Christ, but this is a figurative expression to illustrate the fact that our relationship with God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit has changed. These are matters that I would love to understand more about, and perhaps maybe I will at some future time. Chapter 13 brings to a close a lot of information, and there are some wonderful things said in the book, some golden truths, but uh, I'll not take time to get into them at this point. One other point that disturbed me a little bit was his use of the word wine in reference to the Lord's Supper. We know that uh, it is never used that way in the Scripture, not even a word that could be translated intoxicating drink or non-intoxicating drink. The Lord didn't use that term even to give anyone a leeway in that matter, but he used reference to something that showed the contents of the cup that it would be in accordance with what we do today. 
Thank you, Brother Don. We appreciate those efforts. I think, and I was thinking about this when this was all set up and assigned, that this is a good example of a person at one stage in life and then things moving on, as Brother Don well said, he's not responsible for that, neither are we, as to what he's gone into much later. Um, I think it's good to remember James D. Bales, who some of us had in school and appreciated so much. But I dare say that some of the very younger preachers today who came along the scene a good while after even Brother Bales was uh, dead, Hard to remember anything about him. They didn't instruct him much about him at all, except his false doctrine of marriage, divorce, remarriage. But I remember a whole lot more than that because I had him a class, and I have a good many of his books, and I have no problem saying, well, you know, get all the books you can get from him. Just be aware of the fact he was wrong in marriage, divorce, remarriage. When I first became aware of F. Lagarde Smith, and I've forgotten how long ago it was, he became kind of knowledge, well, the Brotherhood sort of was introduced to him, what, 25 years ago there, back in those days sometime. Does that sound about right? And it was a fav very favorable thing because of some of the stuff you heard here. And people were saying, look here, this guy is to get pepper dying men saying things that other folks aren't saying. But as was well pointed out in recent years, he's taken all sorts of positions. In fact, when he would go to England, he was worshiping regularly with the denominational church. So it goes to show you, brethren, you can't go <laughs> And just say, because this person was right here, that means all the way down the line, he still is. And that's an important point to keep in mind, because frankly, he's gone against a number of the good things he has said in this book. I, a couple of comments here relative to hermeneutics. Personally, I think Brother Tom Warren and Roy Deaver did some of the greatest work ever done on setting out ascertaining Bible authority, which gets the air of hermeneutics. And yet, we all know that Brother Deaver ended up supporting his son on the direct work of the Holy Spirit that personally, as they teach, dwells in the Christian. That's not going to stop me from uh, accepting the good work that he did in his book. Uh, let me say this to everybody regarding hermeneutics. He mentioned it, Brother uh, Don did, regarding the matter of implication and talking about inference. This was said umpteen times by, <laughs> far more than that, by Brother Warren and Brother Deaver in trying to be more precise in expressing how language works and communicating, in this case, the will of heaven to us that we might know the authority of Christ because he has all authority. He's our king. He's an absolute monarch. And to say, as he pointed out, inference is not using it correctly and those who study logic at all knows that we are to infer whatever the document has to say that it implies. We're, if, if we, it's our duty. God expects us in the right division of the word to infer only what God in his word implies. If we do otherwise, we may end up with an assumption, and that's just anybody's guess. But there's one other comment I want to make along that line concerning direct statements. People will say command, and I've heard some of them say direct command. One of the great emphasis that Brother Warren and Brother Deaver put on that is that when you look at the statements, then there's, there's only, a command is only one kind of statement. If you want to be precise, then you say direct statements because there are several different kinds of direct statements of which command is only one of them. And if you read their material, direct statements, implication, and example, an example being a pattern. Now the question regarding example is, and I noticed that Smith just said the examples of the Bible. You've got to ask yourself the question, does this Bible account of this action by the brethren constitute an example or a pattern? We have to learn when that's so, and he touched some on that. So that's important. Uh, the book chapter and verse citations. Of course, they couldn't, as Brother Don well pointed out, do that in the first century because it wasn't there. These things are expedient. That's the only way you can look at them. If you'll notice in the Bible, Paul will say, in a certain place. That's the best you could do. So 
do you think Paul would have said Acts 2, verse 38, if it had been that way? And he had lived in our, certainly he would. It, it's a good way to say, here's exactly the verse and where you can find it. So it's a help, just like a concordance is a help. I was thinking about the young people and accommodating young people when you said this, and it brought to mind something in about 1973 or four when we lived in Van Buren, Arkansas. The elderly couple that lived across the street from us at that time were members of the Methodist Church. And we were visiting one day, and he was really upset because he said the young people at the Methodist Church wanted to be together and do their things, and they wanted to sit on the floor during the assembly. And so, being of that mindset to accommodate, then where the young people usually sit, they, they removed the benches so they could sit on the floor. Well, they put up with that until, guess what? The young people wanted everybody to sit on the floor, and they wanted all the benches out. And he said, we weren't going that far. But that's what you get into, and that was about 1972, when you start this business of being politically correct and catering to the whims of the people. Now think about that, <laughs> catering to the whims or the hobbies or whatever it is of the people. Let me emphasize again that the errors later taught by F. Lagarde Smith that he's known for now have eclipsed much of any good teaching that he did. I believe I'm right when I point out that uh, he is now teaching that there is no eternal hell that a person goes to is lost, and uh, that kind of thing. Brother Dove, you look like you have something moving you. Don't you think that the seed of where F. Lord Smith has gone since the good material in this book is found in his illumination view of the Holy Spirit? That is what opened That's the last the point for everything else. Yes, sir, that was the last point I was coming to. I'm glad you, frankly, I'm glad you put it in the last part of the book because I think that's going to allow, any, if you hold that view, I was going to use this illustration. Some of you are old enough to remember that when we had the Cold War going on, that because the United States and USSR were well, the superpowers they were and they held in their hands each one of them the power to virtually destroy civilization, and because they were so scared of one another that you remember what was placed in the White House and in the Kremlin? It was a hotline. So that if a terrible thing happened, the two people could talk, the two heads of government could talk directly to one another just by picking up the phone. Well, years ago, Brother G.K. Wallace, as those men were very capable of doing, pointed out that anybody that starts this business of the Holy Spirit directly in you, personally guiding you, not depending solely on the instruction of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, said in effect, that person is telling you, you got a direct hotline to God. Now think of the implications of that. That means that beyond the instructive powers of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the infallible Word of God, the complete Word of God, the final revelation of God to man, that you have God giving you the, I used it Sunday morning because that's what uh, Terry Rush said, secret signals. Every one of these fellows come back to this. So he's got insights by direct hotline to God through this direct of the spirit on his spirit to see things. And when you start that, there is no end to where you can go because any thought that crosses your mind, how do you know in view of your own doctrinal position as stated, as you well stated, that he said, is not leading and guiding you. It's the Spirit talking to you. Because you've already admitted he does lead and guide you beyond the words of the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And I think Dub hit it right on the head. I think that's exactly what happened to these folks. It, you know, you can see he knows what logic is. You can see he sees it. Well, if you believe the Holy Spirit's personally in you, directly connected to your spirit, and giving you information and strength, beyond your knowledge and will to obey the word of God, then why wouldn't you come to different views and different ideas because you got a direct hotline to God through that direct work of the Spirit. I just want to add those things on there. Appreciate the work that you did. And it tells us, like if you go back and read Ruby Shelley in the 1960s and early 70s, you're going to find some good stuff there too. 
Brother Bales, yes, you're going to find some good stuff there too. But you don't have to go back that far. There are some brethren in recent years who've taken positions one some time ago that was right in harmony with the Bible that over the last six years they're not taking any more. Now, what does that say to us, brethren? If that can happen to them, what about you and what about me? Thus, as Paul said, we're always, every day, must be on guard. Because what can happen to another person, since I'm a human being moved by like passion just like that person, it can happen to me unless I put on the whole armor of God and use it every day. Because what's Satan doing every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every week of every month of every year? Like a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. Wherefore is just steadfastly in the faith, in the system of faith of the New Testament. And I wanted to add that stuff to it because this is a good example of where people can get people's attention by teaching some good things. And then the way people are, you know, he's my preacher. He can't do any harm. But then when he starts to teach error, guess what happens? We used to be continued to defend him. Well, old brother so-and-so couldn't do that. He married my mother and daddy. He couldn't teach false doctrine. You know how many times I heard that about Batchel Baxter, Batchel Barrett Baxter, years ago? And that was the kind of stuff that was done. Don't let that happen. As far as I'm concerned and your attitude toward me and my attitude toward you and our attitude one toward another, let's make sure that we're always testing the spirit to see whether they be of God and realize Satan very well would use somebody you trust and love to get to you. It's certainly happened many times before. Well, we're a little past time. We'll take a second or two, just a second or two before we get started. Thank you for listening to me. Brother Don, thanks so much.